Mary Met, virtual traveller, and welcome to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that invites you to rewild yourself through story by exploring nature, folklore, and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson, and I'm an author and professional storyteller. Mary Met, folks. Dawn here, and I'm interrupting our usual broadcast of Stories from Law uh, to bring you some news of a couple of interesting projects that I've been working on and that are now products which are available in my shop on my website. So I do hope that you will stay and listen to what I have to offer. So the first thing that I would love to tell you about is that I have created a box which is called A Year of Rewilding Stories. The box has in it a zine which, in case you hadn't guessed by the title, has a year of rewilding stories in it. And within the zine there is a little bit about each month and perhaps what's going on in the wheel of the year. And then there are three stories sketched out for you. So the bare bones of those stories and then links to those stories. So where you can go and listen to me tell them or you can go and read them somewhere so that you can explore the year through stories and rewild yourself through story. Yeah, because I want you to take these stories out into nature and really explore how they connect us with nature and the land. I've put in there a little uh, A6 notebook, which is designed by the lovely Tiffany Francis Baker and her artwork is just beautiful. So I'm very pleased to say that she has designed this notebook with uh, little pictures um, from the seven stories which are included in this story oracle. But I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment, because with the little uh, A6 journal, there also comes a pencil, a little tiny mini bulldog clip that will hold the pages down for you, because if you're out and about, you might want the pages held down and a few little nature stickers in there as well, just to jazz up your journal if you want to. Also, when you're out and about, So occasionally we need a snack, we get a bit hungry. And um, if you're from the UK, you're probably familiar with Kendalmint cake. If you're not, Kendalmint cake is uh, mint cake. It is literally mint flavoured sugar in a uh, bar. Um, Now, unfortunately, I'm only able to ship this to UK customers, but it does come in the box for UK customers. So the uh, last thing that I have in the box is the seven oracle cards they uh, go through the different habitats. So the habitats that I've chosen are woodland, meadow, city, field, hedgerow, marsh and seashore. And on the back of each one of those cards is a link to an audio story. This is an exclusive audio story that goes with the box um, and you can go to a private page on my website to listen to those stories as you go out and about exploring nature and the landscape with stories. You can take the cards with you when you go to the beach to listen to the seashore or go to the woods to listen to the woodland one, or you could just use them like an oracle deck to divine what story you should listen to next. So that's my Rewild Yourself Through Story Box, and I do hope that you find that interesting enough to go and have a look on my website. If you go to my website, which is www.ddstoryteller.co.uk, and then if you go to the shop section, you will find it there. Um, and I will put all of these links down in the show notes for you. So I really want to thank you for listening so far to this uh, information that I've given you about this wonderful project that I've been working on. And the second project that I would love to tell you about is my A to Z of rewilding stories. Now, I set myself a bit of an epic challenge with these because, as you can hear from the title, it's called an A to Z of rewilding stories. So, yes, that means there will be 26 of them. They're small uh, A5 size zines, about 20 pages. Uh, The issue one is out now and issue one is all about ash. So what are these scenes for? Well, your entertainment, of course, but also the A to Z of Rewilding Stories is a series of scenes that seeks to connect the reader with nature and the landscape that surrounds them, as do all the things that I create. We'll do this one story at a time as we move through the A to Z. Each zine takes an element of nature as its focus, so A is ash, and this encourages connection through story, folklore and mindful moments. 
And to accompany each edition, there is also a selection of exercises that will help you to connect with the story. So little things that you can do in your journal if you want to. It also helps you connect with not only the story, but also nature that's within that story on a deeper level as well. And the mindful moment that's included in the zine is also as an audio, again on a private page on my website that you can listen to if you want to. Like I say, I really hope that you are as excited about those uh, projects as I am and that it will encourage you to go and have a look on my website for those two projects. They are available to ship worldwide, both of them, um, and you will be able to find all the information on my website, as I say. Thank you so much for staying and listening a while while I tell you about these story-based creations. And as a little reward, I have included an extra story. Of course, it's always about the stories, isn't it? This story is one of the first stories that I told at Beltane, and it's a story that is very close to my heart, so some of you may have heard me tell it before. It is, of course, the Welsh fairy tale. The real fairy tale, not the fairy tales you find in books. Oh no, the Welsh legend and fairy tale of Schenkin's fairy gold. Schenkin had fallen on hard times. There was a time when he had plenty of work in the village. All the odd jobs would be sent to him, so he'd patch up the roofs, mend leaking taps, perhaps the fences on the farms. He'd turn his hand to most things, but times had got hard for everyone, and people were doing their own odd jobs. There was nothing for Schenkin to do. Schenkin was always resourceful, though. And he was a very good fiddle player. And so that's what he turned his hand to. Each night he would go to different inns and taverns and he would play his tunes and people would throw a penny in his hat. He'd managed to get enough money together so that he would be able to have bread for the table and occasionally they could have meat, but never the wine that his wife would actually like. She would always complain that they didn't have beef, that they could only ever afford pork and that they could only ever have small ale and not the wine that she particularly liked. And she'd always say to him that he really needed to go and get a proper job because playing the fiddle was never going to earn him enough money. Well, Schenkin disagreed. He worked very hard playing the fiddle and it did earn them enough money. It kept them. They did not starve. They did not have holes in their roofs. So what was the problem? So Schenkin spent longer and longer in the inns and taverns playing the violin to try and get more money and, I'm afraid to say, to avoid his wife's complaints. And it was on one of these nights that he'd been staying particularly late that he headed back across the hills. These weren't particularly big hills, listener. They were what were known as the fairy hills. So you can imagine they were quite small sort of undulations in the land rather than actual hills. Schenkin knew of the fairy folk and he knew they were tricksy. But he knew the rules. He knew not to eat their food or to drink their drink. He knew to be polite always, although he did know never to thank them. And he did know that he must keep their secrets. But thankfully, up until tonight that is, Schenkin had never had a reason to remember these rules. However, tonight was different. The moon was high in the sky, and as Shenkin headed across the fairy hills, he looked up at the stars that twinkled next to the moon. He looked up at them like pieces of gold on a navy blue velvet cushion. And he thought, if he could just reach up and pull one of those stars down, well, then they'd have plenty of gold and no need for him to play his fiddle anymore. And his wife would certainly not complain. As he was pondering whether or not it was actually possible to get the stars down from the sky, he heard music drifting across the fairy hills towards him. He could tell that the sound was coming in front of him, and as he looked up and looked into the dark, he could see a tiny little golden castle. He knew this must be the fair folk, and, well, he considered for a moment leaving the path 
but he also knew that there were plenty of other tricksy beings around at night, and so the path was the safest place for him. He was considering how he might circumnavigate the castle when voices joined the music. Shenkin, Shenkin, come play your violin for us. Shenkin knew that try as he might, he could not ignore the request. And it was probably best not to ignore the request of the fairy folk. And so it was that he found himself inside the fairy castle. As he played, he found that the castle seemed to grow taller around him. He was able to go into the castle without banging his head on the tiny little chandeliers and the plush little cushions that were all over the floor. This was clearly a royal fairy household. He continued to play his violin whilst all the tiny people that were no taller than his shin danced around him. They called to him to join him to eat and to drink, but he knew, he knew the rules and he knew that he could not do that. And so instead he closed his eyes and he played his fiddle. He hoped that his fiddle playing would be enough that he would not be trapped in the fairy world forever. For, gentle listener, sometimes if you end up in the fairy world, you can end up there for what may seem like a day to you, but is a hundred years in our world. Schenken hoped that this would not be his fate. He played and played until he could play no longer. He was exhausted, and so he lay down on the velvet cushions. They seemed to grow in order to cradle him and allow him to sleep. And as the music and the dancing feet and the voices of the fairies faded around him, Schenken fell into a slumber. Schenken was awoken to the sound of bells ringing and damp on his face. He looked, it was the grass, the grass of the fairy hills, and he could see that the sun was creeping up over the horizon. A new day had dawned, and when he looked around, there was no fairy castle, no fairies to be seen. Instead, all that was beside him was his violin neatly put back in his case, and a little woolen bag. He leant forward to take the little bag and he pulled on the leather thong that was at the top of it that held it closed and he looked inside and there, there was enough gold coins to last him and his wife for a very long time. He was delighted but he knew better than to say out loud that he thanked the fairies for their reward. Instead, He took hold of his violin and he took up the gold coins and he went straight down into the town. He bought a large side of beef and a bottle of wine and off he went back home. His wife was so amazed to see the beef and the wine that she did not chastise him for being out all night and didn't even bother to ask where he'd been. Nope, she just set about creating them a roast for their lunch. Schenkin took the little purse of gold and he placed it up in the rafters of the house, somewhere where he could keep it safe and keep it secret, for he knew that he must not tell anyone where the gold had come from. After lunch, his wife did inquire as to where he'd been and where he had got the money for the beef and the wine, and Schenkin merely said that he had had a good evening playing the fiddle. She believed him and hoped that this good fortune would continue. Of course it did. Weeks followed days, and months followed weeks, and, well, they seemed to be able to have meat every day if they wanted. Certainly enough wine to keep his wife happy. Schenkin did go out to play his fiddle, just so his wife didn't suspect too much. But, well, the curiosity got the better of her. And she asked him one evening where it was he was getting the money from because surely he couldn't be that good at the fiddle every evening. And Schenkin, well, he replied that she should not worry herself about it and that they had more than enough to keep them going and that his fiddle playing was good. But then the wife started to ask around and she found that no, he wasn't earning that much more from his fiddle playing. 
And so she asked him again, Schenken, you must tell me where the money is coming from. I'm concerned. But why, wife, why are you concerned? We have enough for meat and wine, which is what you wanted. Why are you worried about where the money's coming from? Well, you could have turned your hand to highway robbery, Schenken. I don't know what you've been up to. I really think you ought to tell me I am your wife after all. I have told you, you don't need to worry about it, said Schenken. And well, that was the end of the conversation, for that evening anyway. Of course, the months then turned to a year and came Christmas and they had an enormous spread on the table. And well, the wife, she had to ask again where the money came from. It is of no matter, said Schenken. It is really best you do not know. Well, then why is that, Schenkin? I cannot have you end up in prison. You must tell me why it is. Why it is. Because if you cannot tell me, then it can only be something bad. Perhaps you have been thieving or perhaps you've been gambling. I just need to know what it is, Schenkin. After all, we are man and wife and there should be no secrets between us. It really is better you don't know, said Schenkin. But she continued and the more mulled wine she drank the more persistent she was. Until eventually Shenkin got so fed up that he was not allowed to just sit by the fire and enjoy his cider that he shouted at her, The fairies gave it to me! There was silence in the cottage. Well, now you've done it, said the wife. And Shenkin just looked at her because they both knew what was likely to happen now. Schenkin got up from his chair and he went into the room in the cottage where in the rafters the gold was hidden. He pulled down the pouch of gold, which felt slightly lighter and it didn't chink the way it had done before. It's more of a dull sound now coming from the bag. And as he opened up the bag, there inside were cockle shells. Oh, they were very fine cockle shells. But they were not going to buy them beef or wine. The fairies had made their thoughts clear on Schenkin giving away their secrets. Well, Schenkin, he continued to play his violin in the taverns and the inns. And his wife continued to complain that they no longer had meat and wine for the table. Now, when Schenkin did come back from the taverns and the inns, he did continue to walk through the fairy hills and down that path where he'd seen that little golden castle and been invited in to play for the fairies and been rewarded so handsomely. He walked that way every night in the hope that perhaps, perhaps, the fairies would invite him back. But... Unfortunately, listener, fairies, like wives, have very long memories.